Cool. So uh, guess who has two thumbs and is in front of you and lunch? This dude. So I'm going to try and get through this talk as quickly as I can. Um, but to do that, I'm going to need a little lubrication. So I'm going to be drinking this water. Uh, what I need you to do is every time you see me drink the water, I'm you know, trying to s talk a little quicker. You got to clap. So first off, first one. Cheers. All right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about evolving the graph. Um, this is, uh, was originally intended to be a way for uh, me to run down all the vocabulary that it took to grow a GraphQL schema. Um, uh, but first, you know, actually, I forgot. I need to introduce myself. My name is John. Um, I work at Coursera. It's an education company. I work on the developer experience team. And at Coursera, uh, we envision a world where anyone everywhere can transform their life with access to the world's best education. I'm also contractually obligated to tell you all that we're hiring, uh, both Mountain View and Toronto. Um, it's a case that sounds interesting. OK, so again, back to the talk. So it was originally supposed to be evolving the graph. Um, but then I started listening to a lot of the talks uh, that happened uh, already, uh, and including a talk that hasn't happened yet. And uh, I realized that they kind of obsoleted my talk. So I'm actually going to give you a talk. Um, here are the ones that uh, you know, I'm talking about here. We have you know, Mark's talk, uh, Adam's talk, and in the future, James' talk. Uh, that's, I'm going to actually federate most of my talk to that. So they get to do all the, the fun stuff of explaining all the in-depth details. Uh, so definitely check those talks out. Those are going to go into the technical details of those individual pieces. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I'm actually going to talk about evolving our graph. And by our, I mean Coursera. Um, and I think this is really important because uh, you know, a lot of these words and stuff like that you've heard today, um, you, we haven't really talked about how they pan out over time. Um, so fat disclaimer, uh, take all of this with a large Coursera-sized grain of salt, um, because this is the story of GraphQL at Coursera. It is not the story of GraphQL at Facebook. It's not the story of GraphQL anywhere else but Coursera. I do think that there's some key pieces and some lessons to learn from this. So definitely um, it, just understand that, you know, take, take it with that, with that grain of salt. Um, we've been using it for th over three years. Uh, quick show of hands, who's been using GraphQL for more than three years? Great, there's like five people. Lee's in the front, like, yeah, me, me, me. Um, we get it, you invented it. OK, so uh, <laughs> GraphQL at Coursera, uh, at the beginning, what we really wanted was something that people refer today as data first. Um, I Googled this to make sure that it showed up when you did data first GraphQL, and it didn't show up. So uh, what, I'll, what I'll kind of describe it as is taking your existing APIs and reflecting them through the GraphQL server. So in this case, um, think of it like I have an existing REST API. We're going to go ahead and just port that entirety um, to our GraphQL thing and not really think too much about the GraphQL part of it. The second thing that we wanted was that we wanted clients to be able to uh, uh, take all that data and construct it themselves. We had you know, mobile apps, iOS, uh, Android, and web, and we wanted to uh, have them deal with the stitching work that was happening. So. Cool. So uh, this was actually really interesting because three years ago, the GraphQL ecosystem was incredibly different. Um, but in reflection, it's actually really awesome to see all of the different things that we were able to get. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of those and, 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 and describe how they grew over time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, Federation, um, we actually had Federation three years ago. And you're, you'll hear a talk about it later today. But the Federation that we're talking about here wasn't Federation between GraphQL servers, but Federation through REST. Um, so we had our REST APIs. And this, uh, this thing that we had in the middle, we didn't even have a word for it yet. We, now it's called a gateway, but we didn't have a word for it. Um, this was our GraphQL server. It would just take in a GraphQL request and then send a REST request down to uh, some service and then return the response. Um, this was great. Um, I thought it was uh, a really interesting idea because it meant that we could interop with our existing uh, servers. The other thing that we had was code first schema generation. Um, you heard some of the definitions of code first um, from Adam's talk, from Nicholas's talk. Uh, for us, that looked like this blob. You can't even read that. Uh, so. Uh, we, what we were using was Scala, and we were using the Sangria library to define our resolvers, um, or at least our one resolver. 
through uh, Scala and generating a schema from the other side. Um, and we also had schema stitching. Um, we did the most naive version, which is that we just kind of smushed everything into one file, but that is still schema stitching. So uh, lessons learned. I'm just going to skip right ahead to three years later after having all of these interesting tools and seeing uh, you know, what is going to happen with those tools after three years. So the first one with Federation. Like I said, Federation was really useful for us because it meant that teams could retain ownership over their services. They already had microservices. Um, and this allowed them to deploy them at will as they needed. Um, and, and that fit our company. That fit our team. That fit how our organization worked. Um, because we were using REST, um, and because we had a REST framework on the other side uh, in the actual services themselves, we actually only had one resolver. So this was pretty interesting as well. We weren't really creating a GraphQL resolver for every field. We just used the same resolver for all of them. Um, and they would just delegate to uh, some fancy REST stuff under the hood. Uh, Federation. So with federation, the problem is uh, every individual piece uh, is hard to see what it looks like in totality. And so when you were making a change to the GraphQL schema, you'd only find out that it was breaking when it got to production. And that's not good. So that was, that was in, in retrospect, not a great decision. Um, and we probably should have built tooling around that. Code for schema generation. Uh, this was also really interesting, and, and interesting for the same reasons that, um, that we've heard about code-first development. Um, one, it was really, really simple to get an existing REST resource into our schema. Um, and this was because, again, we were just wrapping our existing code uh, in Scala, our existing REST resources. So uh, you, know, you would have to fulfill one or two things, and we could just auto-generate that into a resolver, to res uh, you know, auto-generate that into a schema. Uh, downside, it was really, really simple to get REST resources into our schema. Um, this was actually not good, because what happened was uh, you know, we had this type explosion of types that actually maybe shouldn't have been in our schema in the first place. Um, based on the numbers that I've heard about Facebook, uh, we're about one fourth of Facebook. So um, yeah, we got that one. Um, but we have a lot of these root fields, and that was actually a big problem, um, because we were exposing things that we didn't expect to expose. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, schema stitching. Um, we made a really interesting decision with schema stitching. And, and the decision was to namespace all of our REST resources. Um, and this made it really, really simple to actually give a lot of room to grow. We didn't really have to deal with the backwards incompatibility thing, because you could just always add a new resource or a new version or a new something else. You never really were modifying old things all that much. Um, I actually think that was a bad thing, because now we, you know, we didn't have a game plan when it came down to we actually had to change a field. Um, in the process of using GraphQL at Coursera for uh, over three years, there were some things that surprised us and, and weren't really, uh, we didn't expect them um, to be as good as they were. One were the GraphQL clients were incredibly powerful. So our server, uh, you know, at the beginning, we were trying to build something really quickly. We didn't actually add mutation support. Uh, we ignored it for prioritization reasons or whatever it was. Um, but it turns out that uh, you know, in, in our web clients, we were actually able to shim that support. So uh, the clients were still able to write mutations and, and write mutations in their GraphQL documents. We would intercept them, send them to rest. Uh, and you think about it, our service was doing that our GraphQL service was doing that anyway. It was just shimming everything and sending it to REST. So uh, we just followed a lot of the same principles. I realize you can't, it's really hard to read that text. So I'll try and read out some of those things. Um, but the other thing that surprised us was our implementation of GraphQL didn't look like GraphQL in the wild. Um, and uh, I'm not sh sure, like, I think in reflection, you know, maybe this looks a lot more like Facebook than, than, than we thought. But it was just hard to find documentation, because the documentation typically wasn't about data first. It was about uh, using uh, uh, schemas, writing schemas, whether it's SDL first or code first. So it was just a little difficult to figure out um, where we were in terms of building our, our GraphQL server. Um, and the biggest realization that we had uh, only came in reflection as we were trying to figure out, you know, we took a step back and we said, is this actually doing the right thing? And the question that we had to ask was, is a data first schema the best use of GraphQL? Um, and the answer is actually, yeah, you know, I think 
it is a good use um, when you know what you're doing. And for us, GraphQL got us a really long way. It, got us th it lasted for three years, right? That was really a big deal. And the, that version of GraphQL powers a lot of our web applications as well as our mobile applications. So what, whether, whether you like data first or not, um, it worked. And I think that was, that was the most important thing. Um, but the big caveat that we had and the thing that really drove us to, to rethink what was going on here was this sort of fact, or I hope is a fact, is that you have the, a schema for your service, your REST resource, um, and you have the schema that your UI ends up using. And they're not always the same. Um, and this might feel like an obvious statement, uh, especially with the, you know, with you know, all of the, the talks that we've heard today and just GraphQL out in the wild. But remember, the context under which we built GraphQL was that our clients were going to be responsible for pulling in all of that data together. Um, and it's, it's really easy to understand that when your schemas look like this and you have a client schema that's very different from your service schema. But where we get fuzzy, where we're sort of on that spectrum, that gray area of, OK, is this schema actually doing what we want, is when our schemas overlap like this, where the API and the code first thing that's getting uh, exposed to the clients is just close enough. And you know, there's, there's maybe one or two fields that are needed, or one or two things that are not needed. Um, so it's interesting to hear uh, you know, the Facebook take on it, where you know, the, the back ends build those APIs. Sometimes we don't have time to build those APIs. And then you get this weird sort of mismatch between the schema that the client needs and the schema that the service provides. Um, and all of this kind of sums up to like clients and, and the way that we use GraphQL. They don't just need data. They need information. They need structure between uh, all of the individual bits and pieces. And GraphQL is really good at doing that. Um, but because of the way that we were constructing our GraphQL server, which by, you know, for all intents and purposes was a glorified REST proxy, um, it felt different than what we were seeing out in the wild. So, oh. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, where we go from here, um, I think uh, somewhat, uh, you know, as, as we're looking at this solution, looking at data first, I think one of the things that we are realizing is um, thinking more about our schema and thinking more about the quality of the schema. So, we had all of these types. But they weren't particularly useful. We were just auto-generating things into the wild and just and hoping that they were connecting really well. But we weren't really thinking about the composition of those pieces. Um, so we're definitely, you know, with our new GraphQL server, we're optimizing for quality over quantity. We want to make sure that we're farming the schema, not just building out a gigantic thing. That's not the goal, to expose every data. Now we want to make um, best use of GraphQL to, to build uh, you know, useful clients. Um, we also want to elevate GraphQL into a language. And you know, this is an overloaded term, but as a language to be able to communicate not just between clients and servers, but a really great way to communicate between engineers. And that's because for a front-end engineer to go and grok all of the Scala services, like, there is a huge gap there, uh, unlike maybe an annotation uh, uh, in Hack. Th this is just the reality of our company. Um, and again, I want to reiterate being really intentional about what goes into the schema. We've seen what it looks like to just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And now um, we want to take a step back and say, hey, actually, let's try and build this out uh, somewhat like uh, 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 Mark's talk about being intentional about curating your API. That sounds really great to us. Um, and all in all, what we found, and remember, this talk was about evolving the graph. It turns out it's not the graph that evolves. Like, we had all this tooling, and our graph was growing, and it was changing, but it wasn't evolving. It wasn't learning something new and saying, hey, you know, maybe your clients should do it this way, so like, modify your schema this way. All those technology choices just helped with our mindset, our context of how we're building GraphQL. Um, and the thing that evolved was us was the people, uh, the engineers, uh, that were learning and growing with the ecosystem and realizing that, hey, actually, we could use GraphQL for a whole lot more. Thank you. <laughs>